Mike Tyson even existed. He was Charles Sonny Liston, the indestructible, or so boxing fans and experts thought. Most of America didn't want Liston to hold what was long considered the most glamorous title in sports, heavyweight champion of the world. But for a time, it looked as if Sonny would hold the title for a long time. Born in rural Arkansas, Liston had little education and spent his youth on the hard scrabble streets of St. Louis, where he had frequent run-ins with the police. Liston was in and out of prison and for much of his life associated with less than savory characters. As forceful a presence as Liston was inside the ring, he remained a mystery outside of it, even in death. Up next on Behind the Fights, we'll be joined by boxing experts Jack Newfield and Burt Sugar as we examine the mystery of Sonny Liston. Who were you when you had your first boxing match? Well, when I first started, I was about 13. I went to the gym and I got a selection, so I said, that. <laughs> that's not for me. And, so, and then again, I waited until I got 18, and I was big, and I, had, I weighed 218. So I figured, I said, well, I'm a man, now I can take it on my own. Liston must have been a fascinating character to you. He was, because I think he was, it was like, on the surface he was this sullen, sad, inarticulate monster. But I think deep inside he was uh, misunderstood and sensitive and wounded uh, and a real, like a tragic beast, almost like King Kong to me. Charles Sonny Liston was born May the 8th, 1933 on a little farm near Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He was one of 25 children born to a poor sharecropper. Most of his childhood and his adult life was surrounded by poverty and discrimination. His education was like any boy that lived on a rundown farm and on the streets of a slum neighborhood. I know Charles Sonny Liston. He's a good man and he's a kind man and worthy of a chance to contribute to society. I am Mrs. Sonny Liston. I realized what this guy's life was like, one of 25 children, uh, beaten every day by his father until he was 14, had welts on his back the rest of his life, could neither read nor write, uh, went to St. Louis, became a criminal, went to prison, was taken over by the mob in prison. The mob, Frankie Carbo and uh, John Vitale, owned him from day one of his boxing career, and he hated being owned by the mob, but he could do nothing about it. They were his way out. But he projected this image that they wanted him to project of, of, of being intimidating, uh, looking at people as though he hated everyone, looking at writers as though he hated all writers. Uh, he did. Hate, hate, one of the things that made him hate writers was that all the writers would make fun of him claiming to be a certain age when we all knew he was older. And to make fun of how old he was was hurtful to him because he didn't know how old he was. When he was born, all he did was chop down this tree. There was no birth certificate in, the, in rural Arkansas. Years later, we tried to reconstruct his age from police records in St. Louis, but he was always five, at least five or six years older than his publicist claimed he was. As you pointed out, the mob controlled Sonny Liston. Why did the mob want fighters? What did they do with their fighters? Well, the mob has always had a controlling interest in boxing. The mob controlled Primo Panera, who was the heavyweight champion in the 30s. The most the richest prize in sports is the heavyweight championship, and the mob wanted to get back control of the heavyweight title. Did they want to fix every fight, or did they want to have the best fighters to win every fight? They, in some situations, they wanted to fix fights for betting coups, uh, but with Liston, they wanted a heavyweight champion, and they knew this guy can, can, can knock out anybody if he hit them, and it was just a question of finding the right front managers, and they, they kept finding these priests in Philadelphia and Denver who were gonna, always going to rehabilitate Sonny and redeem him. Rehabilitation, it comes from the Latin word re habilis. And it means, uh, uh, basically, it means the changing of a man's character. I cannot accept this word rehabilitation as far as Sonny Liston is concerned. I would rather say that and think and be convinced of the fact that this is reorientation. Now, the first fight we're going to see, this is in 1958, when according to the record book, he was 21 years old. He'd already been fighting for five years professionally. He already had a, a prison record behind him. So obviously the 21 may not have been good. He had a serious prison record, arm robbery, 
uh, assaults on police officers. Uh, he began a fight in prison. Uh, and from the beginning, and, and he was owned by the mafia. And, and he was seen from day one as, as a menace to civilization, a threat to, to, to the cleanliness of sports. Nobody wanted to see him become a contender. No one ever wanted to see him to fight for a title. But in 1958, he was beginning to be perceived as a possible contender. We're going to see now his second fight against Burt Whitehurst. Whitehurst went the distance with him the first right. time. Burt Whitehurst was a very cagey veteran, and he was one of the few guys Sonny could knock out because uh, Sonny was one of these classic punchers with either hand like Dempsey or Lewis or, or later like Tyson hit. Enormous punching power, and he knocked almost everybody out quickly. And at this point in his career, he had lost only once to somebody named Marty, Marty Marshall. Marshall. who he later knocked out twice. Okay, and now we will see fight two between Sonny Liston and Burt Whitehurst. Thirty seconds, and the crowd is rooting for the underdog here. That's Burt Whitehurst, in white, Sonny Liston. Second left. Six, seven, eight, nine. The bell rang. The bell rang, and he's on his feet. I don't know whether it'll be scored a knockout or not. That was about as close as we've ever seen a finish. Whether he was knocked out, the bell rang, and I don't know what the, whether the referee's going to call it a knockout or not. Is that a knockout? The bell rang at seven. It is not a knockout, and the bell rang, and the, uh, the referee said he was on his feet, so it is not a knockout, and for the second time, Burt Whitehurst has gone the distance. A very, one of the most dramatic finishes we've ever seen in a fight. The winner by unanimous decision, Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston. That's a decision for Liston, a decision about as close as you can get to a knockout. We've seen now the potential in Liston. Where does he go from this fight? Uh, White, White, most guys who fought Liston just try to survive rather than win. And Whitehurst was a survivor, a clutcher, a mover, a grabber. But he even went into the audience to escape. But right. a, a, a few other guys uh, did try to f f punch with Liston. One was Wayne Bethia, who Liston knocked out in the first minute. And then he fought uh, Cleveland Williams, who was a very talented heavyweight. He was actually bigger in size. And then listen, and later he, he would fight Muhammad Ali in 1966. But Cle he fought Cleveland Williams twice, and Cleveland Williams went toe to toe with him in both fights. Uh, he hurt Liston a couple times in the first fight, but in the second fight he knocked him out in the second round. But Williams stood toe to toe with him, and you can see Liston's punching power, his uh, character. Uh, he was not a quitter, as people came to think of him later on with Ali. He took a good punch. He did not have a weak chin because uh, he took Cleveland Williams' best shots, walked through Cleveland Williams, and knocked him out. But was there any particular fight when you first realized that you, 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 you came in, you're ready to go, you could beat anybody? Cleveland Williams, when I fought Cleveland Williams after, and I went to the dressing room, and all the newspaper writers came in and said, well, now that we believe you can take it after that fight, and he must have been real tough. He was, he could punch real hard, and he was fast. And after that fight, I failed that I could beat anybody. We're very happy to be able to visit with Mr. Joe Trainer, chairman of the Illinois State Athletic Commission. Joe, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to tell us why, in your opinion, New York did not allow the fight, and you saw fit to bring it into Illinois. Frank, I don't know their reason. They didn't so state it. I, I believe, though, that they, they are not in favor of rehabilitation, whereas we are. I recall an incident we had with Rocky Graziano when he came up for a license. He showed me his fists and he says, Commissioner, this is the only way I know how to make a living. Uh, I'm sure he's never let you down since. No, he hasn't. He's been, he's been a credit to himself and to the game. Well, that's a very commendable attitude. Well, when they turned me down for a license in New York to fight for the championship, mm -hmm. something I've always wanted to do, it was kind of sad that they did it, but it, Chicago made me very proud of it. We're with Jack Newfield, newspaper man, author, and of course, like everyone else these days, a television commentator. Sonny Liston has now established himself as a, as a logical contender for the heavyweight champion of the wor world. Floyd Patterson is the champion. How did they get together in the ring? Well, actually, it's a, it is a fight made by John F. Kennedy, the president. Of course, yes. Uh, after uh, Patterson regained the title from Ingemar Johansson and then knocked out Johansson in the third rubber fight, he's invited to the White House to meet President Kennedy and kind of small talk banter from 
crib sheets, uh, JFK says to Patterson, when are you going to fight Sonny Liston? <laughs> and Floyd Patterson is awed that the president would ask him this. He comes back to New York and he tells his manager, Customato, the president expects me to fight Sonny Liston. And Customato says, you can't beat Sonny Liston. You're not going to fight Sonny Liston. You're going to fight a bunch of stiffs for a few years. And Floyd says, no, I have to fight him. The president expects me to. I met the President of the United States, and he even said to me, you know, make sure you keep that championship, <laughs> you know, keep your example up. It was nice. But I would have much farther went up in the mountains somewhere and secluded myself away until I fought. And then come out, and everyone told me, I said, it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I was successful. So at this point, Cush really didn't believe Floyd could win. Did Floyd think he could win? I don't think so. I mean, Cush knew he couldn't win. Cush had coddled Patterson. He had defended his title against really very weak challenges like Roy Harris of Texas and Pete Rademacher in his first professional fight. He had been coddled, protected, he did not have a good chin. Uh, I think Patterson is like a fourth tier I mean, he, heavyweight champion. He had knocked champion. down so many times by Johansson, of course, he had knocked Johansson down so many times too. And at least he had the distinction of being the first person ever to regain the heavyweight championship of the world. That's right, but I, uh, he was not, uh, I think he lacked confidence against Liston and, his, and it turned out that he was so uh, fearing that he would lose, that he brought uh, a disguise to Comiskey Park in Chicago, uh, a fake beard and a fake nose, to, to hide, thinking he was going to lose in advance. And no champion ever thinks he's going to lose, but Floyd Patterson believed he was going to lose. The challenger, favorite of the odds makers, enters the ring. Sonny Liston, winner of 33 of 34 fights, 23 of them by knockout the most formidable challenger the champion has ever met. The champion, sentimental favorite, Floyd Patterson, winner of 38 of 40 fights, 29 of them by knockout. The youngest man ever to win the heavyweight title. The only man ever to win it twice. Liston's heavy jabs bother Patterson. Patterson's bobbing and weaving make Liston miss often. The Liston hook to the head is the first good punch of the fight. The challenger moving in, the champion shaking off the effect of that left hook. Raising right and a solid left to the cheekbone drops the champion. Around Sonny Liston, the 21st heavyweight champion of the world, jubilation for Floyd Patterson, the former champion, consolation. The winner of the new world heavyweight boxing champion, Sonny Liston. It took only two minutes and six seconds, but years of waiting. Listen as Floyd Patterson has praise and a plea in behalf of his controversial conqueror. It's a little bit bad for me, I guess. Too fast. What about a, a return bad. match? But you still won. Yes, I do. I think perhaps in the return match, maybe I'll do a little better. But there's one other thing I'd like to remark about. Yes, sir. Uh, although I was fairly beaten tonight, I think that if the public gives Sonny, like I've always said, a fair chance, I think that he will wear the championship probably just as good as I have, not better. I think he has other qualities that are good. I think should give him a chance. I'm sure you're, you're uh, happy over Patterson's attitude. He said some nice things about you, Sonny. Yes, he did. I really was surprised <laughs> that he stood up for me like he did. And in the oversimplified world of boxing, evil has just defeated good. Uh, that Flo Floyd Patterson was sold as kind of the meek, safe, polite Negro to, in contrast, to Sonny Liston, the ex-con, the strike breaker, the, the, the guy who's owned by the mob. Uh, although I have to say that 35 years after the fight, uh, I figured out that I actually have more respect for Sonny Liston as a, as, a, as a human being than I did 
for Floyd Patterson and all this, I think, marketing uh, did not really appreciate the, the good side of, of Liston and a kind of a phony, petty side to Patterson that the, that the writers at the time neglected to expose. And which you didn't see at that time either. But now, here it is after the fight, Sonny Liston should be on top of the world. The, the, the morning after the fight, Sonny flies back to Philadelphia with Jack McKinney, who's a, a journalist and a talk show host in Philadelphia, and, a, and Liston's best friend. Yeah, and okay. Liston is preparing a speech. He, is, he believes he has wiped the slate clean, that he's going to be a, given a chance to become like Joe Lewis, who's his hero. He's actually sitting with McKinney on the plane. Uh, McKinney is helping him pre prepare a speech where he's promising to be a good champion and not uh, embarrass anybody. He just assumes there's gonna, the mayor is going to be there and there's going to be a big parade. And the plane lands in Philadelphia and nobody is at the airport. It was a crushing, crushing experience for Sonny Liston. It showed him that no matter what he achieved uh, in his life, he will never be able to overcome the outlaw image of, of negativity. Well, in the morning I get up at 5 o'clock and I run about 5 miles. Eventually I woke up to 5. And after that, I eat breakfast, take a walk for about a mile and a half. Then I sit around for a few minutes. Then I go back to bed. Then I get up and come over and have me a cup of tea. And I start training, skipping ropes, hitting the heavy bag, light bag, boxing, to get my body in shape. Then I go and have dinner. And we're getting ready for the second fight between Sonny Liston and Floyd Patterson. And this fight is different in at least one way. Floyd Patterson didn't bring a disguise to this fight. I don't want to give away the result, but I will tell you, this is a longer fight than the first one, which maybe had not been anticipated, because nobody saw any way that Patterson could win the second fight, did they? That, that is true. I think this is Liston at his, where is it, at his peak is a kind of invincible monster. And at the same time... Uh, and scaring opponents the way Tyson in his prime, I think, scared Michael Spinks, uh, and Alex Stewart. People were afraid of, or professional fighters were afraid of this. He, he looked unbeatable. This is the way Foreman was at one point in his career in his, in his early 70s. And Floyd Patterson had, to a certain degree, shown fear in the ring during the first fight. Why would he go back and try to fight this again? What mechanism in a fighter makes him you know, think he's even going to survive to go into the ring like that? Uh, unless he was uh, a masochist, it didn't make any sense. He just did not have the talent or the punch to, uh, or the mobility anymore in his legs to, to deal with a guy like Liston. It's hard to conceive of any manager not wanting his fighter to go into a big payday, but did Cuss try to talk him out of it? Cuss was vehemently opposed to him fighting Liston, and uh, the first as I, time, first time, as I recall it, Cuss just didn't want him to fight Liston. It was a, a doomed mistake. And Cuss D'Amato, as you'll see watching the second fight between Liston and Patterson, was not exactly ring, the former champion and now the challenger, Floyd Patterson, 28 years old, the only man ever to hold the heavyweight title twice. The heavyweight champion, Sonny Liston, 30 years old, and the man who won that title last September at Comiskey Park, Chicago, in two minutes and six seconds. trying to get underneath the champion straight punches, runs into a right uppercut, which sets up the challenge. Amato, who discovered Patterson, comforts his defeated protege. 
Liston receives the congratulations to the victor, scorns Cassius Clay, who's heard to say, Liston's not great, he'll fall in eight. Bert Sugar, boxing historian and writer, joins us now as we cover the short reign of Sonny Liston as heavyweight champion of the world. But after defeating Floyd Patterson for the second time, many people in and around boxing thought that, that Sonny Liston was invincible, that no one could beat him. He signs for his next fight against a 21-year-old kid about to be 22, Cassius Clay, who has won 19 straight fights. And now the buildup begins. Well, basically, Cassius Clay had baited Liston into this fight. He had been in the ring in Which both... Which everybody thought yeah. was you know, craziness on, oh, no. on his part. Oh, yeah. he had gone after him. He'd been in the ring at both the victories over Floyd, both in Chicago and Vegas, uh, sort of insinuating himself into Sonny's victory parties in both cases. He had gone to his home in Denver in what he called Big Red, his bus, to go bear hunting and bang on his door in the middle of the night in order to aggravate him. And the ultimate salesman. And he had even gone to Vegas before the Patterson second fight and tried to infuriate Liston. So he goes to Willie Reddish, who is Liston's trainer, and says, where is he, where is he? Willie says, why don't you go on over and gamble over at the Sands, you'll find him. Well, Clay doesn't want to gamble at the Sands, he wants to get at Liston. He walks in, there's Liston at a crap table, and he starts screaming, chomp, chomp, and Liston doesn't look up. Chomp, chomp, I'm going to get you, and he's screaming for everybody to hear. Liston finally looks up in that baleful stare of his, pulls out a gun and bang, 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 bang. And Clay runs out as fast as he ever could. It was a setup, it was blanks, and Liston roared for an hour. He had gotten Clay. Now Clay's got to get back at him. And it went on like that until finally Liston said, why not? He said, I'm going to kill him. It's going to take me a round and a half to catch that thunder jaw and half a round to knock him out. Let's do it. They sign. And they go to Miami Beach to get ready for the fight there, and now the atmosphere becomes as wild as it was in Vegas. Oh, I, everything about it, from the fact that Bill McDonnell, the promoter of the fight that's going to be held in Miami Beach Convention Center, is threatening to call off the fight unless Clay then renounces his heretofore public announcements about Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. Clay says, I'm walking out. He actually called his bluff. McDonald says, no, no, it'll go on. That's scene set one. Scene set two, the day of the weigh-in, the afternoon of the evening fight. Here comes Clay. <laughs> Up to then, weigh-ins had been quiet. Two people get on a scale, one steps off. And Liston is trying to get close enough to Clay to give him that death ray, baleful, stare you through look. He can't even get close to him because everybody's pushing around. But, but he's not just instigating at this point. He's acting crazy. I mean, as crazy I, as, as you can possibly act. At least to a sane person's eyes. Knowing that the one thing that Liston can't deal with and is afraid of is an insane man. And here comes the doctor over, and he takes his blood pressure. It's 200 over 100. He says he's scared to death. So the writers go run out and file. Jimmy Cannon said, fights off, man scared. <laughs> he goes back to his room, listens to the words of Elijah Muhammad for an hour. And within an hour, it's 54 again. I predict that tonight's combat will die and rain out and shot. Cassius Clay on the move as we see, looking to get Sonny to run, carrying his left hand dangerously low. Note that the champion, Liston, the aggressive man, Ooh. a good heavy shot dug under the heart. Sonny has to set the pace. That's the way it looks at the outset. Cassius, awkwardly fast. Good long left lead that might keep the champion a bit off balance. Yeah. 
Sonny seems to be trying to slip those left leads. Can't do it too successfully because the challenger is jabbing all over. Body, head, and right hand. The best punch of the fight so far. Moment when Liston did not come out. How stunned were you? How stunned was everyone? Well, there were there were two moments in between. Number one of which was Liston got a small cut in the second round, which was open to a gash in the third by Clay's punches. The second thing that happened was in the fourth round, between the third and the fourth, and for the first time, Liston sits down. He's tired chasing. His quarter starts to put liniment in his eyes, which we later found out was alcohol and wintergreen because he theoretically had a, a sore shoulder in training. That liniment gets into Clay's eyes, albeit two of Liston's previous opponents, Zora Foley and Cleveland Williams, had complained of their eyes singing. Now it gets into Clay's eyes. Between the fourth and fifth round, he goes back to his corner, and he says, I can't see. He's wobbling around blindly. Get these gloves off me. Get these gloves off me. Angelo Dundee, runs, who's halfway down the steps, runs back up and says, this is your night, big daddy, and shoves him out in the ring, though he can't see anything in the fifth round. Secondarily, the black Muslims who are at ringside run over to, uh, to, to Clay's corner to get Dundee thinking he'd put the, the ointment in, in Clay's eyes, and, and Dundee thinking quickly puts it in his own, showing him there's nothing wrong with it. Meanwhile, we've got going on in the ring, a man groping blindly, the referee's thinking of stopping the fight, Liston is wailing away at his body, almost unable to catch his head because he's leaning back in that famous Muhammad Ali later uh, act that he did against Foreman in, in uh, Zaire. Sort of a modified rope of And yes, and meanwhile, halfway through the round, his eyes clear. So while he's there, he stops in the middle of the ring with about a minute left and starts popping Liston again and raising welts under his eyes. And at the end of the fifth round, Liston goes back to his corner. It's all over. He goes through one more round, and now comes the end of the sixth, and he's sitting there, dejected, on his stool. And he spits out his mouthpiece almost as if it has a bitter taste. They might be stopping it. That might be all, ladies and gentlemen. Get up there, Joe. Get up there. Get up in the ring. Sonny Liston, at that point, was no longer invincible. This man, who wanted to be the baddest mother in town and took great pride in it, no longer was. Lewis and Maine adopts the heavyweight championship fight banned in Boston. Sonny Liston challenges Cassius Clay on a bright, placid day in May. And for a few hours, the eyes of the sports world focus on this normally quiet northern New England industrial city of 41,000. Why did they pick Lewis to Maine? It's sort of a meandering breadcrumb <laughs> tale. February, the fight's over. Almost immediately, they start talking about a rematch. It's in Clay hyphen Alley's contract. The people who own the contract are the Nyland brothers who are Liston's managers, who are fronting for others, as, as you've pointed out. Let us just out. leave it at, at others. <laughs> others. Yeah. Uh, and there are rules.